Yeah, thank you for inviting me to this wonderful place. Uh, I, I'm a geophysicist by training, actually, and uh, I turned planetary scientist after uh, my um, uh, postdoc at UCLA back in, in the 80s uh, when I, my supervisor introduced me to planets. And uh, I got interested in astrobiology, actually not knowing that we did astrobiology, but I, you know, I used to do thermal evolution calculations and at one point in time. I thought, well, look, I mean, we have you know, radioactive decay, we have convection in there and everything, uh, but what about life? I mean, is there a feedback from life to planetary evolution? We know about the atmosphere, but, but how about the interior? Uh, and I, I think that was in 2008 something, or well, a little earlier, six maybe. And so we wrote a proposal to um, a German funding agency uh, and um, we got the funding, and that was that was very good. That you know started some of the work that um, DLR then uh, picked up doing in in what we then later learned is called astrobiology. At the time, we were only thinking we do planetary sciences. Anyway, so um, uh, I was asked to uh, put together you know some introduction into formation, evolution of planets. Now you should be aware that. You know, not all of what I'm treating today is, is what I'm expert in. So, you know, some of the stuff is, uh, you know, just like I understand it and I'm trying to pass it on to you, my understanding. Uh, but um, I'll try to do that such that you get an introduction and can pick up, you know, from there and, and look at the literature if you're deeper interested in, in these processes. Now, um, this is my outline. I would, uh, you know, spend a little bit of time uh, speaking about habitability and concepts of habitability. Then I'm spending some time on the formation of planetary systems, which uh, uh, you know, people are doing these days to better understand how the planetary system, well, our solar system, formed uh, and how that would apply to, to planetary systems in more, in more in general. And personally, I believe that uh, the use of the exoplanet studies that we have so far uh, to date, actually, is more in a sense of better understanding how planetary systems form rather than, you know, how, planet, how planets uh, themselves are working because we don't have enough data. Although it is interesting, and I will show you some of the results, if you increase the size, you know, what happens to a rocky planet if you make it just bigger. Uh, then I will spend most of the time in the evolution of uh, pla uh, terrestrial planets. So I'm not really going into uh, giant planets, although uh, these are of great interest to exoplanetary studies. But uh, I concentrate on terrestrial planets because we're looking at it from the perspective of astrobiology. I will talk about surfaces a little bit, interior um, magnetic fields, how they generated atmospheres and life, and I will conclude you know, with a model that a student of uh, mine and I are sort of promoting these days that, you know, would couple plate tectonics uh, and life and continental growth and so forth uh, together uh, in an integrated uh, system. And I hope I can convince you that some of that stuff makes uh, a little bit of sense. Now, um, just a motivation slide. Uh, I believe that, you know, finding life uh, beyond the Earth is important. Uh, and I'm not the only one who thinks that way, but, but the, the space agencies are, you know, looking along these lines. And uh, I think that much of the stuff that we're doing uh, in planetary exploration is actually driven, you know, by the idea of finding life, uh, you know, in a, in a place other than, than the Earth. Uh, and you can, you know, convince yourself that uh, the exploration of Mars, I mean, the big program that uh, uh, NASA uh, and also ESA and JAXA uh, are having uh, is mostly driven by, by, by that idea. Can you find habitable conditions and life, you know, uh, at, a, at a planet other than the Earth? And Mars is your favorite target because it's close by. You can relatively easily get there. Uh, and uh, in comparison to Venus, for instance, it is a planet that is at least, or has been uh, to some extent, uh, habitable in the past. Now, um, it is of some philosophical relevance, because you can argue that finding life would complete the Copernican and Darwinian uh, revolutions. 
and put our human existence into perspective. So we're not the only ones, we're not the center of the universe, uh, rather we're just one of, uh, you know, many uh, manifestations perhaps of, uh, uh, of the, highly, the, the, the highest uh, um, um, organization form of matter uh, in the universe perhaps. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, uh, which is what is important of course is that um, finding of the search for extraterrestrial life uh, you know, rests on some research of understanding uh, you know, uh, and predicting you know, where you can find it. So you when you talk to people who are looking like for instance in, in Antarctica or, or in other uh, desert uh, parts of the world, you know, for uh, you know, finding life there, you know, they, they speak about you know, finding like uh, the needle in the haystack. Uh, and it helps, you know, if you have an understanding of where to look, you know, if uh, you can do that uh, when, you, when you go there. And uh, the same, of course, applies to Mars. And in the background here you see uh, Giordano Bruno, you know, who's got burned uh, in Rome, you know, 500 uh, or so years ago because he was one of the first to uh, promote the idea of uh, uh, that we're not alone on this, this planet, but there may be other uh, civilizations in the universe. And here is a picture of the ExoMars rover Pasteur uh, that is uh, set out to find extinct or extant life uh, on Mars. Now this is a picture actually from where I live in Berlin. Berlin is a pretty uh, green city actually. You're looking across the river Spree to the te uh, Treptow Park and you see some of the, the things that set the Earth apart. Water, fauna and flora. And uh, if you look at Mars, you know, today, uh, this is a picture of our uh, uh, high resolution stereo camera that we're operating, uh, my institute is operating on uh, Mars Express and you see that today Mars is a cold desert. And how to, to understand, you know, why this planet here is looking this way and Mars is looking that way uh, and how this came about and, uh, you know, what the chances of uh, finding, still finding some traces of life here in this desert is of course you know, one of the motivations uh, that drives us uh, to, to this research. Uh, I want to speak about uh, habitable zones and the ideas of habitable zones. I don't know if anybody else introduces the concept in this uh, series of lectures, but I'll start in doing so. And I'll pick up at where Cyril left us uh, this morning uh, talking about uh, metallicity in stars and actually people are using the concept of on the one hand looking at the metallicity of stars and the other hand looking at, um, at uh, uh, supernovae uh, and balance the two to, uh, to see what is a habitable zone in, in the galaxy. So there is this definition of a galactic habitable zone introduced first, I believe, by Gonzalez and others. And there's a recent paper, it just came out by Foregan et al., uh, you know, who through model calculations came up with this uh, evolution of uh, habitability in our Milky Way. Uh, and, um, you know, it's hard to read actually on, on this, uh, this screen, but he, they plot the number of planets that remain in Clement, that means habitable conditions. Um, as a function of uh, you know the the place in in the galaxy, and you see that that actually the most um, uh, clement uh, or favorable conditions are relative close to the center of the galaxy. Although there should be the the black hole, you know that's of course not a good place to be, but but anyway, I mean uh, 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 there apparently you're shielded you know by the sheer number of stars you know from the uh, effects of uh, nearby supernovae. Uh, and you have enough uh, metallicity there, planets there with uh, high metallicity uh, or stars with high metallicity that allow the formation of planets in order to actually produce uh, terrestrial planets. So that is an interesting, uh, uh, you know, finding. But there are other in the arms of galaxies. There are other cores or, or, uh, of, of uh, habitable uh, conditions. Now I'm not an ast astrophysicist, so I can't really. Uh, you know, judge that from uh, a critical point of view, but uh, you know, it's, uh, as a planetary scientist, I find it interesting that you know we're used to looking at habitable zones in uh, planetary systems. Now we can look at habitable zones on a galactic scale. Now, uh, moving on to um, the habitable zone in a planetary system, 
Uh, there is this thing called the Circumstellar Habitable Zone, CHZ, or SHZ, the Stellar Habitable Zone. People use this, this definition of that uh, uh, interchangeably, I think. Uh, and it is defined as the distance from the host star where temperature and pressure conditions allow for liquid water to exist, and I should have said here, on the surface. Okay? So you're looking at, at planets, the surface temperature of which in their atmospheres allows for um, uh, the, the existence of, of water. And here we have the water phase diagram, uh, and you can actually see that uh, here is the Earth, and the Earth is in a, at, a, at a pressure and a temperature range that allows for the existence of liquid water uh, at the present time, while Mars is very close to that triple point here, uh, and actually there is only thermodynamically at present time, you can only be in the vapor uh, or gas uh, phase or in the solid phase. Uh, here's vapor, here's solid. Uh, and, um, you know, these, these concepts, you know, differ a little bit from whatever paper you're reading. You know, some uh, are very sophisticated and, and moving the earth, you know, in, in, uh, uh, in, a, in a distant range, uh, you know, uh, about its, its present center to, uh, to map the, the boundaries, the inner and outer boundary of, of the habitable zone. Others have more simple concepts of the atmosphere, but in any case, you're in, including um, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, greenhouse uh, effects in, in that uh, and, um, uh, and, and then calculate uh, the surface temperature and check that with a phase diagram of water. Now, there is a little bit of, uh, of weirdness in, in there, if I may say so, because you know, this definition actually allows you to go up to the, to the uh, critical point here. Uh, and if you moved Venus a little bit and put it right here, uh, then of course there would be liquid water on the surface. Uh, however, um, these temperatures you know, uh, are uh, much larger than any temperatures that, according to my understanding, and I'm not a biologist, uh, you know, any, any living things, uh, proteins and so forth, <coughs> would actually support. So, um, you know, you could probably argue that the inner boundaries of the habitable zone should be uh, defined maybe a little more uh, stringently. Uh, anyways, I mean, this, uh, the habitable zone is then a, 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 a function, sorry, a function of uh, the insulation by the star, and that uh, insulation rate or luminosity scales with the mass of the star, and there are certain, uh, we heard this this morning uh, in a very nice presentation, you know, how the, uh, the luminosity varies with uh, the mass of the star and the type of the star. We're here at a, a typical G star, I understand, and here is our solar system. Uh, and here are the three planets that, in a very generous interpretation of habitable zone, would lie uh, at the border of it, uh, Venus and, and Mars, and, and the Earth, of course, right in the middle. Now, this uh, has been put together by uh, Heike Rauer from my institute and others. And uh, what they've did, they, they plotted you know, some of the, uh, the, the, the planets from other, um, uh, uh, other planetary systems in there, uh, and uh, of which we know the, uh, well, no, not, not all of them. They're from the transit method and the radio velocity method. So we do not know from all of them uh, what their radii and their, their masses are, but from them, some of them, the, uh, uh, we know the mass, and from some of them, we know the radius, and actually, we would like to have uh, have uh, both. But, anyways, so there are some, uh, you know, some of them have been detected, and I think they're probably. This is not the newest slide. Uh, there are probably more in the in the meantime uh, that uh, cover uh, uh, habitable zones, but. Um, most of uh, the plants, and I have a, a slide later that, that shows that, that are found there are actually giant planets. And uh, uh, what, we're, what, what we're looking at, assuming that giant planets are not necessarily what we're interested in in talking about habitability, uh, we're looking at uh, terrestrial planets, and uh, these are rel still relatively scarce. Um, uh, most of the plants, and we heard that this morning, that you know the smaller stars are more popular, uh, more, more populous in, in the universe, and therefore, uh, you know, much of the discussion goes about 
uh, plans around M stars. They're typically close in. That means they're easily uh, detectable, relatively speaking, in, in comparison to uh, uh, plans around G stars that are further out. Uh, and uh, so uh, much of the discussion is then about um, you know, the habitable zone around uh, M stars. However, um, there is a, you know, as I understand it, a quite a different radiation environment around an M star in comparison to a G star, so that even if you had you know, uh, a significant number of uh, planets in the habitable zone of an M star, you couldn't be sure uh, that they wouldn't be bathed in, uh, in radiation and life would actually be possible. Um, when one talks about this concept of habitability, uh, then one should be aware that at least in, the, in, in our solar system that there are, there could be habitable niches, uh, you know, in other places. And one of these places is the, um, the subcrustal, or no, not the subcrustal, but the subsurface uh, uh, depths of, of Mars, for instance. Uh, you know, we know that, that life can exist, you know, from, from the pressure uh, on the Earth up to a, a depth of about three kilometers. And um, uh, on Mars, that scales to 10 kilometers. So um, if we then, then uh, are, are sure that we won't have uh, liquid water uh, on the surface of Mars, but how about a depth of 10 kilometers? Uh, and it's easily possible to, uh, to envisage that uh, here you may have uh, liquid water and therefore uh, there may be niches, uh, habitable niches, uh, you know, in the subsurface areas of Mars uh, at, uh, at depths of uh, a few kilometers. Unfortunately, these depths would not be accessible for us, uh, you know, at the, at the present time uh, and therefore are out of, of our reach. But that is, of course, a possibility. And other possibilities of um, of um, you know, possible habitats outside the habitable zone of our solar system uh, are you know, the well-known cases of Europa and Enceladus, you know, where you are definitely out of the habitable zone, but still you, know, you have water, oceans, underneath ice layers, you may have the right temperatures, nutrition, and so forth, and, and, uh, uh, and uh, you may actually have uh, habitable conditions. This has led some people to say that, well, the habitable zone is everywhere. Now that is perhaps a little bit of a too extreme point of view, but uh, one should be aware that um, you know, this story does not uh, cover the whole picture. Um, now there are other requirements in habitability rather than water on the surface, although uh, I would agree with, with uh, uh, you know, many who say that uh, certainly, you know, from our understanding of biology, water is the most important, next to carbon, uh, perhaps uh, uh, substance for life as we know it, uh, and therefore it's an easy indicator of habitable conditions. Uh, but, you know, for life to evolve, you know, beyond uh, the primitivist uh, uh, forms, uh, you may uh, you ask for more. And uh, that would, of course, uh, include, for instance, the, uh, the stability, excuse me, of, of climate. Obliquity variations of the rotation axis could be a factor here, which have, uh, Mars has suffered from excursions of that. We have the moon uh, to stabilize our uh, rotation axis and pr uh, you know prevent us from from uh, large excursions of uh, of the rotation axis. Um, carbonate silicate cycle, so that is basically plate tectonics operating and other geochemical cycle cycles that would stabilize uh, against excursions of the climate. A continuous supply of nutrition, surface rock renewal, you know, could be an important uh, element here, so that when, whenever, you know, stuff is eaten up, basically, from the base of the food chain, that you renew it and, uh, and provide uh, uh, new nutrition. The magnetic field is, is often cited, although uh, I tend to believe, uh, I tend to side with, uh, with, with uh, those who say that this is often uh, perhaps over, uh, over uh, stressed because uh, there is harmful radiation that the magnetic field doesn't help you against. Uh, and it's basically the atmosphere that, that protects us. However, uh, the magnetic field, of course, uh, you know, protects the atmosphere and, you know, more indirectly than, uh, you know, protects uh, the biosphere on the surface. 
Uh, geological diversity is an important element, at least as, as far as we understand, and we don't have a deep understanding of uh, the origin of, of uh, life, but geological diversity is certainly uh, a driver that you know, uh, allows us, uh, allowed, you know, formation of, of uh, life on this planet, but it's also uh, probably uh, at the heart of, of uh, keeping uh, uh, life, a life, and I will speak about uh, continents uh, uh, a little later versus the end of my talk. And then, of course, there is impact and other cosmic hazards uh, need to be low. Now, that is something that there is little to be done about. Uh, other than, than saying that we have a disaster plan. And actually, and actually, I mean, there are people looking at disaster plans and uh, there are uh, also, like, like other space agencies, you know, are looking at these issues of how to, um, you know, uh, perhaps, I mean, if, a, if an asteroid comes by that, that is, uh, you know, uh, to be detected early on, how we could divert, you know, his, its, its uh, path if it is on the way of, of, uh, of hitting uh, um, the, the planet. And actually the United Nations have a program that is looking at this, this issue. And, uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, something that, uh, you know, concerns people and, and with uh, certainly some right to do so. Now, um, you know, in, 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 in many treatments of habitability and uh, astrobiology, you see that the claim that plate tectonics, you know, could be uh, important. Uh, and certainly, uh, you know, if, uh, considering what I said in the previous slide, uh, you know, in many of these things you had plate tectonics, you know, actually tacitly involved, like in the carbonate silicate cycle, the magnetic field generation, the continuous supply of, of nutrition, you know, there's all, all this, you know, in, in a way, at least on, on this planet, you know, related to plate tectonics. Uh, and what it does, and I will speak about plate tectonics more in the remainder of my talk, but what it does is it recycles near surface rocks and volatiles to the planet's interior through subducting, you know, crust into the interior and, and continuously forming new crust. And that helps to cool the interior and drive the magnetic field generation, the dynamo, we'll speak about that. It creates geological diversity. Uh, continents are, in our understanding of the geology, a manifestation or a result of plate tectonics operating on this planet. Although, you know, there is, you know, a, a still, you know, to develop a deep understanding of how plate tectonics started uh, and, and how, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, continents uh, came about, but our present model of the growth of continents, at least, is, uh, uh, is tied to, to the, the plate tectonics concept. We replenish uh, <coughs> surface rock through plate tectonics, we stabilize the atmosphere in the carbon and silicate cycle, and we help to generate the magnetic field. Uh, now, before we go into the detail, let me speak about another uh, habitable zone definition that I just uh, uh, learned recently about. I know, if, uh, uh, actually, I couldn't find out whether uh, these authors have uh, uh, created or coined this term now, or whether it may be in the uh, other wider astrobiology uh, uh, community it is already uh, introduced, but they speak about a biogenesis habitable zone, so a zone wherein conditions are just right to have life emerge. Uh, and it is not a zone in a strict sense of a, a distance, but rather, as I understand it, is a range of physico-chemical parameter values that allow for the formation of life. And, you know, as far as I understand, it is not as well defined as the CH set, for instance, or the SH set. Uh, and that may have to do with, uh, with the problem that we're not really having an accepted theory of the uh, origin of life. Uh, anyways, um, this is a repre representation is from their paper uh, of some of the ideas uh, that they have, and I found uh, this quite, quite interesting. So um, in a, in a, in a, in a uh, plane that is spanned by parameter values, you know, whatever they are, um, you define, and, and this here is time, you define a subset of parameter values that defines you a, 
uh, abiogenesis habitable zone. Though these at the at four billion years ago, these are the conditions that led to the formation of life at, on this planet. Now they don't care whether you say, well, it was only 3.5 billion years ago or three billion years ago. You know, sometime uh, in the past, I mean, you formed life on this planet. Now they're saying that usually. Uh, conditions move away from, from this uh, set of parameter values. And I don't know if that is true. I think that, that can, of course, be debated. Uh, but um, uh, uh, it may be so. And, uh, and that would mean that uh, uh, the, gen uh, the genesis of life could only happen at some you know, uh, uh, you know, range of time, so to speak. Uh, in, in the life of a planet, and then later it would not, no longer be possible. Uh, but then, of course, what they introduce is the concept of maintaining life. And here in this, um, you see that there is a wider defined range of values of the planetary environment, but then there is a subset of habitable conditions that may not you know, be coincide, it does in this, this uh, plot, but it may not fully coincide with what the planet does. And um, another representation of that is on, on the right-hand side here. Well, this is the habitable conditions, and assume that they, in the sense of the circumstellar habitable zone, assume that they are constant in time, that they would not evolve. And here are the planetary conditions, and then you have the abiogenesis habitable zone right here. So they coincide; all three coincide for some time, but then um, the, the the actual planetary conditions move away from both the abiogenesis habitable zone and the circumstellar habitable zone conditions, and life would then disappear on this planet. This, so this may have happened on Mars that actually you had, you know, for some time. Uh, the condition to form life and to have a, a little bit of, of time to evolve it, but then Mars went dry and cold and, and just moved away from, from the nice uh, uh, region here. Now, they're arguing, and I actually have a lot of sympathy for that, uh, that um, this form here, this, this uh, what do you call that, a, a, a hose or something uh, could be deformed, you know, by the action of life itself, you know, to to allow for life to to exist further, and that the extension of it could actually move in time. So there may be conditions that uh, you know would be more habitable than at other times, and. And at some point in time, it may, may go away, and the planet may evolve uh, away from from the habitable conditions, and then life would 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 die on 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 this uh, on on the planet. Uh, and um, they are arguing, and therefore they call it the Gaian regulation, Gaian regulations, that life itself, you know, may you know, be active in stabilizing habitable conditions. And of course, you know that life plays a role in the in the carbonate silicate cycle by fixing carbon in, 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 in uh, carbonate rock. And that, you know, by stabilizing the temperature on the planet may be one way of how life, you know, acts to stabilize uh, the habitable conditions on, on this planet. Um, and um, uh, you can then, of course, discuss that and ask yourself, why does that not happen on every planet? So it, uh, uh, and I think they, they're quite reasonably arguing that it is a matter of, uh, of the biomass. If the biomass remains small, you know, life cannot act to, to modify its, uh, the, the conditions on the planet. But if life you know, evolves quickly enough, then you can, uh, life could pick up and you know, maintain the habitat conditions there. So I think this is a, a quite an interesting concept. And in a way, it, it, uh, it coincides with uh, some of the stuff that I will show you versus uh, uh, the, the, the end of uh, my talk. Now, here is a, a little bit of a, of, a, um, of a more detailed explanation of what they're talking about. Um, they're looking at, at the, uh, the temperature on, on the planet and the time since the planet formation. Uh, and here are certain models you know, that uh, show the evolution of, uh, of temperature, uh, starting somewhere around here, and then you know, excursions in the early evolution of, of the atmosphere. And then you may run into a runaway greenhouse and leave the habitable 
uh, conditions in that way, or you may fall into a, 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 a runaway snowball effect and you know leave by, by that way, you know, and uh, uh, and only you know if you have a feedback mechanism that stabilizes temperature, can you then extend your time you know within these bounds that that define your your habitable uh, temperature conditions. And here is today, and you know, people were talking about what's, what's in the future. So in the future, according to this model, probably because the, 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 the sun uh, you know, grows and becomes a red giant, uh, temperature becomes too, uh, become too, too hot, and then we're leaving um, this, and, and life will then die on this planet. Now they go on to speculate about uh, the, the problem that Fermi had put out. Why are we not finding you know, many um, uh, civilizations in our neighborhood and uh, of course there is a possibility that they didn't form uh, but it is also possible that they formed uh, but then got ex extinct and uh, you know uh, but I don't want to, to enter into that discussion in, in, in my talk actually. Anyway so um, this is an interesting concept and uh, I think the stabilizing effect at least uh, has a lot of sympathy with me and I believe that uh, there is uh, you know, something there to be uh, further explored, uh, even beyond just the carbon the silicate cycle itself. Now, um, just to, to summarize that a little bit, so we, we may have habitable planets in the habitable zone, like for instance Earth with all its workings, interior workings, magnetic field generation, uh, plate tectonics and so forth, and uh, it's our standard uh, model of a habitable planet. We are oriented in our thinking along the Earth, which is uh, perhaps a little dangerous because uh, you know, planets could function otherwise, but of course we're, you know, from our own experience, we're sort of biased uh, towards um, this, this picture of it. Uh, and here is a habitable, or what people think is a habitable uh, planet, at least from, the, from the, the sheer definitions of having water and, uh, and other things uh, of Europa, where you have uh, the uh, moon of Jupiter, where you have um, you know, an ocean covered by uh, ice, protecting it against uh, uh, you know, the ocean against uh, you know, the cold temperature in the Jovian system and the harmful radiation uh, uh, from Jupiter and so forth and so forth. And also, I mean, the, the, the nice thing about uh, Europa that sets it apart from the neighboring uh, moon Ganymede and, and Callisto that also are believed to have oceans is that here the ocean is in direct contact with the, we believe at least so, in direct contact with uh, the rocky uh, part of the planet and therefore you have, you know, all the chemistry that can, you know, be uh, used, you know, to um, uh, derive nutrition and, and feed your uh, possible biosphere in there and people have calculated uh, models then and looked at whether uh, you know the nutrition would uh, be able to support the small biosphere and yes uh, it seems to be that way. Also the, the question of energy of course is, is important uh, because um, and I actually uh, didn't mention that so f uh, yet but energy of course is important on the earth we have uh, uh, solar light, we can use uh, the photons uh, from the sun. We of course have very little you know, lighting uh, here in Europa, but we have tidal energy and uh, that may be sufficient you know, to at least uh, power a small biosphere in, in there. Um, so, um, you know, in order to, to discuss these things, uh, and, and therefore I think the, the title that, that Muriel chose for my talk is, is very uh, uh, much applicable. In order to discuss these things, we need to look at, at two issues. We need to look at the formation of planets, so how do we get wet, rocky planets in the habitable zone, uh, and that are not bothered by invert migrating giant planets that would kick them out or force them to become their moons, in which case then the, uh, uh, the, the evolution of life might be at least much more complicated than if there are you know, plants in their own rights. And then we need um, to look at the workings of plants as they co-evolve with life uh, and uh, you know, look at something like this guy in bottleneck that uh, Chopra and Line Weaver were uh, addressing. This is uh, the slide that I was already alluding to a little earlier. This is a little complicated manifestation of uh, uh, basically what the, ha the habitable zone in terms of the 
stellar temperature, which is another proxy for stellar mass, uh, and stellar flux, which is a proxy for distance from the planet. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if this is your habitable zone, you know, so to speak, then runaway greenhouse or, or extending to that. I mean, the, the point that I want to make here is from what we know about exoplanets, you know, there are a, a high number of, of, uh, of giant exoplanets, you know, in this, in this regions. And, um, you know, we don't, we're not too pleased by them because, uh, you know, they are migrating inward and uh, disturbing whatever, uh, nice little, you know, <laughs> terrestrial lands you, you might have in there. So um, there is probably something like a habitable, uh, not only a habitable planet, but also a habitable planetary system, you know, where you have the, the terrestrial planets at, at uh, the right place. Uh, yeah, I wanted to, to give you a little bit of, of a few textbooks that I, you know, at least find uh, interesting in, in the context of planetary sciences and planetary geophysics and, uh, uh, habit, uh, and, and astrobiology. This is only a subset of what's available, but, you know, if you want to uh, take a recommendation, then maybe uh, Imke de Pater's and, and Jack Lissauer's book I find very interesting. Also, Jonathan Lunin's Evolution of a Habitable Bird is more like Geophysics is not so much planetary, but, but still, I mean, it discusses astrobiology. Bill Hartman's Moons and Planets is a classic in, in, uh, uh, in, in this uh, field. Uh, thank you very much, Muriel, for um, you know, giving me uh, this morning this book, so I put it into the list. Uh, I have to say that I haven't read it, but uh, I scanned through it, and uh, very nice pictures, and it, it looks very promising, so I put it in there. Uh, there are, of course, a number of textbooks in geophysics, geochemistry, and geology that I don't want to mention. There's an interesting collection of articles in a book, Planets and Life, you know, by Woodruff et al., that, that I at least uh, con consult. Um, uh, and then uh, this is a commercial. Uh, <laughs> we have the Encyclopedia of the Solar System that uh, came out in 2014, the, the third uh, edition. It is actually not so much an encyclopedia in that you can pick up, you know, various things and look at definitions, but rather uh, a thousand pages of articles on, on anything related to planetary, uh, 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 solar system, astrobiology, and, and so forth. And uh, um, I just wanted to make to to uh, uh, to put your attention to it because it was so much work to put it uh, together. And then, there, of course, there is the Encyclopedia of Astrobiology that, that Muriel is, is editing together with, with others, and I have the uh, privilege of being one of, of the editors of it as well. Um, now, while the Encyclopedia of the Solar System is you know, suitable for students uh, from, and, and also you know, uh, laymen, you know, uh, because I mean, it doesn't go too much into detail. It's very convenient, I at least use it, you know, to read if I want an introduction into a field that I'm not too familiar with. I mean, go to this, this uh, uh, five to ten pages and you have at least a modern understanding of what's going on and you know, what the basic things are. Uh, the Treatise on Geophysics, Volume 10, is also about planets, and this, of course, goes more, much more into detail and depth. And so if you're, for instance, um, interested in the thermal evolution of planets, you might start with that here, get a feeling whether that is something you want to uh, you, you want to uh, look further into, and then you can consult this thing here, and there's another article on the thermal evolution of planets, but that is much more detailed and goes much, in much more technical and so forth. Anyway, so I hope that maybe this is useful. So, um, formation. Um, now, um, the, our, ba our understanding of uh, solar system formation, as I understand it, I have to say that I'm not, not really active in this field. I'm looking at it with a great interest, and I'm trying to you know, teach some of the basics whenever I get to, to teaching a little bit. Uh, it, you know, it's basically still you know, what, what uh, uh, Immanuel Kant and, and uh, uh, Pierre de Laplace uh, proposed you know, uh, in the 18th century. And I, I understand they developed that independently of each other. Uh, and they're looking, you know, they propose that the planets were formed from a nebula under attracting and repulsive forces. Now, attracting is gravitational and repulsive is, I mean, the, the, um, you know, the collisions of planets. 
Uh, and that is still, you know, the basic of the idea of what we're having, uh, you know, as our understanding of the formation of the solar system and planetary systems. But uh, the details of, of uh, this is uh, uh, a subject of ongoing, very intense and very interesting research. Uh, and uh, there have been a significant, uh, you know, evolutions of, of, uh, uh, of the concept over um, the past years. And I think that in the last 10 years or so, then, or no, it's a little longer than that. I think that started in the 80s with the work of Wetherill uh, and others. I mean, this has really picked up uh, uh, and uh, is, is a very active uh, field. Now, um, you know, I mean, this is science, so you need uh, constraining observations. Uh, and um, uh, of course, there are samples, meteorites in the, uh, in the planetary dust particles, cometary nuclei are of interest, asteroids, planets, and so forth. So, you know, whatever is to be found in, in um, you know, relevant observations uh, on these bodies, you know, is of course something that, you know, the, the models of planetary formation, you know, need to fit. So for instance, uh, something like the late heavy bombardment, you know, needs to be explained by, uh, by that, or, you know, isotope uh, variations and so forth and so forth. Now there are collections of meteorites that, that are of course available, and here in the background you see people collecting uh, meteorites in Antarctica. So they're still, you know, uh, on the search and on the hunt for, for these uh, rocks. Uh, missions to primitive bodies, like for instance, Deep Impact, our Rosetta mission that will end uh, this year, um, you know, has, a, uh, an, an implic has implications for planet information models. Hayabusa, um, the mission, and Hayabusa 2, the follow-on mission that has been launched uh, last year, you know, will provide uh, data that constrain these models. Dawn, Osiris Rex that is on its way, the NASA mission that's on its way to a, a asteroid, and Dawn, of course, was visiting Ceres and Vesta, as you probably know. Comparative uh, astronomical observations, system of exoplanets, young stars and their environments, and so forth. Lab studies, mass spectrometry, and so forth. And then, of course, modeling. Uh, and um, the modeling, you know, I'm a modeler, you know, from by training, so that is something that I am mostly interested in, and therefore, you know, the main uh, my talk will, you know, be more on the principles of these models than on these other things that I still find very important. So I started, I mean, basically the Zafrona's gas dynamics models, where you uh, had a, a um, you know, the evolution of a of a cloud of gas to a disk, and then condensation in the disk, and he, he, uh, he uh, got uh, the planets from uh, discussing the, the, the gas dust uh, uh, nebula, to then studies that looked at an ensemble of planetesimals, and uh, like a hundred or so, that, which is what Weather started with, uh, and then looked at the orbital dynamics and interactions of these particles and how they agglomerated and ate eat each other, got destroyed and so forth. Uh, and one of the, the, the popular um, you know, things that are around and is discussed is, is for instance the Nice model, or one should actually say it's more like a fam family of models because when you look it up, the Nice model actually is a model to explain the Kuiper belt. You know, it's not a model <laughs> that explains the solar system, but variants of the Nice model, you know, have, uh, have uh, you know, been broadened and, and discussed much more than the original papers uh, that, uh, you know, pop uh, popularized uh, that, that name. Uh, and, you know, that France, you know, Nice is, is the city in France, you know, that uh, uh, where this, this work was first done. And, of course, France and uh, Alessandro Morbidelli, of course, uh, and others, you know, played a, a major role in that. A variant of it is the Grand Tac model that I will briefly come to. Uh, and then there is um, a relatively recent uh, development is uh, uh, what they call the pebble accretion model. And the pebble accretion model uh, bridges a gap uh, that, uh, you know, the, the, the other models have, and I will speak a little bit uh, to that. Now, um, the important elements of uh, the theory of the formation uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, planets is you start out with the nebula, and the nebula collapsed to a rotating gas disk. 
Then condensation and growth of solids, thermodynamics, sticking of particles is an imp uh, important um, area of research. The sticking of particles is a, is a very, um, you know, it's problematic and, and people like Jürgen Blum in, in Braunschweig in Germany and others around the world, you know, spent their careers in trying to understand, you know, how uh, through electromagnetic and van der Waals forces uh, small particles would, would stick together. Then, um, you know, the, the, the Nice model and, and, and their varieties are basically orbital dynamics, you know, of, of multi-particle uh, uh, ensembles. Uh, and here you have, of course, ne Newton's laws and Kepler's laws. It's just a, I mean, it's basically Hamilton mechanics, but what they do. Viscous track between um, the gas and, and uh, the, the, the solids is important, and this is, I think, what, what the Pebble model uh, has uh, highlighted. Gravitational interactions between the bodies uh, and the growth by collision and, and, uh, and sticking and gravity uh, and destructions uh, through collisions is, is another important uh, element of all of that. So we, we start this by um, by having a, gust, a gas and dust nebula, probably uh, only gas in the beginning, and then uh, the condensation of, uh, uh, of uh, matter in that uh, hot nebula, uh, fed by stellar explosions. Uh, uh, isotopic Im inhomogeneities were partly removed by mixing. Then the, the nebula collapsed uh, uh, to form a rotating disk and the action of uh, probably a near stellar explosion. Details are a matter of research. Uh, the mass concentrated in the center. Uh, today, you know, in the, in the solar system, we have 99.86% of the mass uh, in uh, the sun. Uh, but, you know, during the evolution, the angular momentum of the remainder of the nebula was, was transferred from the sun to the remainder of the nebula, such that 99.5% uh, of the angular momentum of the system is in uh, the, this other part, not in the star, so in the, in the, in the, in the solar system, through gas track and, and, and magnetism. Uh, and here is a picture of the Orion Nebula with, uh, you know, forming stars in there and, uh, yeah, okay. Now, uh, here is um, our, uh, again, from the Orion Nebula, um, and this, these, all these have an extension of 400 AU, uh, and you see, you know, young stars with their, uh, with their disks uh, surrounding them. And uh, they're different in, uh, in their, uh, uh, in their um, um, you know, temperature and, and, and mass, uh, but they're all, you know, ab about the same age. Um, and uh, this has been taken with the Hubble uh, uh, telescope, uh, and uh, uh, there are, uh, you know, the, and, and oxygen is, is bluish, so you have a lot of oxygen in, in this. And hydrogen is greenish, uh, and nitrogen is red, so wherever you, you know, you have uh, a reddish uh, tint to it, then, uh, uh, you know, you would expect uh, that, that this indicates uh, hydrogen. Now, this is from Mark McCochrian, uh, who's now playing a leading role at ESA. Uh, and uh, when he was still at the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy uh, in, in Germany. Um, for the discussion of, um, uh, of the evolution of uh, uh, the nebula and, and the planets uh, from there, we need uh, to gauge the time. Uh, and this is an important element of saying, you know, when is time zero, you know, in, in these models. And um, it has been agreed that um, the, the time or the age or, or relative to the present uh, time of the so-called calcium aluminum rich inclusions, which were, um, you know, among the first or the first uh, uh, solids that formed in the nebula, that they, their age should set time zero, which is this number in here. Uh, and of course that matters uh, for processes uh, that um, you know, are or have been going on in the Earth system. For instance, uh, uh, the decay of uh, uh, heat-producing elements like uh, aluminum-26 or, uh, or iron-60. Uh, and, you know, their half-lives is, is very short. So, you know, it, it matters, as you can see later, you know, how you are 
um, you know, positioning yourself, you know, relative to, to that, that time zero when you are actually forming uh, these, these planetesimals. And um, you can see here in comparison, I mean, this is a plot of uh, those elements that are uh, powering or heating the planets today. And you see that their decay on that time scale doesn't even really show up, you know. I mean, so this is the short-lived isotopes in comparing to the uh, long-lived uh, isotopes. So anyways, I mean, what the point that I want to make at this point here is that this is our time zero relative to our present time. Um, this is a, a rendition or the, some pictures of uh, how these first you know, solids may have looked like, uh, you know, from uh, meteorites, I guess uh, they have been collected. Uh, and, um, you know, this is an idea of, of what was, hap was going on in, in, in the nebula at the time. So you see that the gas in here, you see that there are smaller bodies and larger bodies, that larger bodies are colliding, smaller bodies are colliding as well, but uh, you know, they form smaller bodies through these collisions, but you also stick some of the stuff uh, to you, and, uh, you know, through the process of called oligarchic growth, you know, you're uh, having the, the bigger ones eating the smaller ones, uh, you know, and then, you know, form from the planets uh, from that. And here is uh, sort of a little cartoon uh, that shows, I mean, two bigger ones going through here and smaller ones on, on different orbits, and some of them are attracted towards uh, them and, uh, uh, and are then, uh, you know, eaten by, by the bigger particles. Also, you know, if you have uh, bigger particles, um, you know, passing by through the action of gravity, you know, you slow them up and then they may, you know, with the right conditions may, uh, you know, uh, collide. And if the collision uh, is just right, you know, they may stick to each other. If the collision is too um, powerful, you know, they would destroy each other and then, you know, uh, form some of the, the small stuff here. But in the end, you know, when you do these calculations, uh, you usually get some runaway growth, you know, of the small of the large particles um, at the expense of the small particles, uh, and you end up with uh, something like that here. And this is a um, representation of a numerical model uh, that uh, you know goes back to uh, George Wetherill in in the 80s, uh, and um, so there is a accretionary mean lifetime which is the res reciprocal of the time constant for an exponentially decreasing oligarchic uh, growth rate. So if that growth rate decreases in time, uh, then you form, you know, depending on, on the tall parameter here, you form, like for instance, a planet like the Earth uh, within uh, about uh, 40 million years or so. Uh, and you can gauge these, you know, the, the various tos that you do not get, you know, from easily from your model calculations, you can gauge that, you know, from, for instance, hafnium tungsten isotopic uh, uh, determinations of uh, the, um, the time or formation of, uh, of the planet, including core formation usually, uh, and you can compare that and then you, you know, end up with a preferred model that would, would go something like that and you would then conclude that, well, yes, we formed the Earth in, in that, that uh, time span. Um, how are we doing in time? Okay. Um, now, this kind of model is, um, they, uh, you know, they, they, they have a kind of unpredictability in it. So they do not necessarily, you know, end up with the right planet at the right place with the right uh, composition. And here is a representation of that. So uh, assume that you start with a nebula that is ordered according to red, uh, yellow, green, and blue uh, components. Uh, and if you don't like it, you know, in that way, you, you think that this is uh, um, uh, uh, very refractory, like iron, something like that, and you assume that there's a, a, a temperature gradient in the nebula, so you have the, the stuff with the, the high uh, um, condensation temperatures um, uh, right in, at the center, and then as you go out, you know, you have the increase of the uh, volatility, you know, so that you have water, ice, and so forth uh, out there. But, you know, for the, for the purpose of this, we can just call it red, yellow, green, and blue. 
Uh, and then you, you have these models run, and you see that these are various outcomes of, of a model calculation like that. So you may end up with uh, three planets uh, and a small one out here, so two big ones, one small ones, and it would, have, uh, would be composed of, of, uh, of this. And, and this was sounds a little logical because the reddish stuff is uh, making up uh, at, at least a third, and it's more, this one is redder than that one, and you know, this is formed uh, in, in near the interior and so forth. Um, and, um, and, and here you have three planets, and here you have four planets, uh, and uh, you have this bluish one uh, uh, out there, uh, and, um, and here is another that actually looks a little bit like the solar system with the two small ones and, and, the, and the big ones uh, in between. But um, the, the point to make here is that, that actually um, you cannot easily say, and th this I, I think was, was you know, one of the uh, recognitions that Wetherill actually made, because before Wetherill, uh, we had understood, well, you know, look at Mercury. I mean, Mercury has a lot of iron. It has a big core, and that's okay because it, it's been formed close to the sun, you know, in the hot condition, in, in, in regions of, of, uh, uh, of um, uh, the solar system. And then we go outward and we see the chemical gradient. But Wetherill showed, actually, that you can actually have Mercury form, you know, right here, and then late in the evolution be, uh, you know, through some gravitational interaction with the neighboring plants be brought to that place. Uh, and it is not clear, you know, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in these calculations that you necessarily, you know, end up where, um, you know, you started uh, uh, when, when you formed. Uh, and one uh, famous, uh, you know, um, um, Result of that, for instance, that, that was done by the Nice model is in the Nice model, if you look at the classical Nice model, uh, Uranus uh, and Neptune change positions you know, during the evolution of, of the Nice model. Uh, and uh, so that you know, Neptune was closer in and Uranus uh, was further out, and then they changed uh, positions. So that is entirely possible uh, in these models, and, and therefore uh, you know, there is some uh, you know, the, you, you get manifolds of, of various solutions uh, from them. But still, I mean, uh, if you look at these large uh, families of models, there are trends uh, of uh, things to be recognized, and, uh, and this is actually what then, uh, you know, people look at, and, uh, uh, and when they're concerned about certain features of their models, this is actually what, what they're concerned then about. And one of them is, and I will come back to that later, uh, is actually the small mar uh, mass of Mars. Uh, and um, that is uh, something that, uh, according to the expert in the field, should actually not be the case, you know, if you, if you don't have any extra effects. Uh, and uh, much of uh, um, uh, the research that was, was going on in recent years, including the Grand Tack model, and also this, this Pebble model, uh, and it was motivated by finding an explanation why Mars, you know, is so small. Uh, and you see, in, this, uh, in these models here, it would not be this small. Here is another one, but this doesn't fit because th these guys are too big. They're usually not so much concerned about Mercury. Um, uh, the reason for that, and this is my speculation, probably is that Mercury is, is formed so close in you know, to the Sun, though that conditions are special there anyways. So uh, uh, that is, doesn't really concern people too much, but Mars apparently does. Okay, um, now in, um, in the evolution of, of uh, this theory, um, there is an interesting transition, and this transition is, uh, is, is shown here, from a phase where, part where um, the, the, the bodies are so small that gravitational binding actually doesn't really matter, because their own gravity is so small that they almost don't attract each other. Uh, and, and in this regime, you know, you have to bind these uh, through um, van der Waals forces or electromagnetic forces. This is what they call the sticking regime. You know, here and, and this, this is that um, be below a meter or so. And you see that the, the sticking efficiency um, decreases, you know, with uh, increasing size because, uh, 
you know, the, they're, they're becoming too heavy, you know, for, for sticking, you know, at, at one point. <coughs> and at the same time, the gravitational binding, you know, picks up here uh, and uh, increases, uh, you know, with, uh, with uh, size and mass uh, further on. Now, it's been um, uh, a, a problem, you know, for many years, how to, uh, how to get through this gap. You know, how do you actually, in your formation of a planet, get the planetesimal to cross this gap here? You know, uh, and not, you know, stick with, you know, if, you, if you start at small sizes, just be, be stuck with that here. Uh, and, um, and this is actually what's been, is that my next? Yeah, okay. Um, this has actually been uh, only recently, well, actually recently, I mean, it goes back to Burke that was pioneered in, in, in 2007, but that's uh, almost eight or nine years ago now. Uh, but um, it's been, uh, you know, explained by, by what is called the pebble accretion model. And the pebble accretion model, if you think about it, is actually relatively simple. Um, uh, but <laughs> if you look at the papers, it's not that the simple thing, with, you know, the heart of it is not actually always so easily visible, you know, in, 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 in the papers themselves. But what's at the heart of that is actually um, the viscous track on pebbles and planetary embryos combined with their gravity. Uh, and uh, so the pebble model would only work if you have pebbles, that is rocks, pebbles up to the size of, uh, of meters or so. Yeah? Uh, and and they have to be moving in a gas, in a viscous gas. Uh, and um, uh, what, what, what happens if you're moving through a viscous medium, you know, you're, you are leaving a wake behind yourself. You know? And the, in the wake behind yourself, anything that gets into the wake you know, does not experience the same viscous track as yourself. Okay. This is what, what cyclists use, you know, the Tour de France. I mean, when they, they call that the, the wind, wind shadow cycling or whatever. So, you know, one guy r cycles in front and the others are lining up behind him. And the, just the reason for that is they're riding in the wind shadow of, of this guy. Okay. Uh, and um, uh, I actually crossed about this effect uh, a long time ago when I was looking at uh, at, at bubbles in, 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 in magma, so I was interested in, in getting magma bodies to the surface. And I, I read, uh, you know, a, a paper by a famous uh, hydrodynamicist, uh, you know, who had expanded the Stokes model of flow around a, a sphere, you know, to include um, ensembles of spheres. And what, what they showed is that if you have a bigger one moving in front, the rest just you know, settles behind this guy, you know, and, and travels in, in its wake, just like the cyclists do. Uh, and and um, this also happ happens with these, these pebbles. Uh, and, um, uh, and therefore, if you, if you look at that then, their radius of it attraction, you know, becomes much bigger than their actually physical radius. So they are collecting the stuff, you know, in, in their neighborhood, uh, and, and, and putting it, um, you know, behind them, and then they can catch up with it and, and merge with it. This is also what, what you see in these bubbles, that the bubble, you know, that, that follows the big guy just, just uh, you know, moves towards it and, and finally, you know, is, is, is uh, you know, um, merging with the big one. You can see that also, that effect when you, when you travel on, on a railway, and you see, if you look at the, the water on the surf, uh, on, on the window, you know, and you see little things that, and then the, there comes a, another one that, that f uh, you know, moves in the wake and it picks up, you know, speed and, and gets to the big guy in front of it. And this is actually what, what, what's behind that. Uh, and um, uh, and uh, uh, what they calculated here is, and I have to read these numbers here myself, is that you can increase the radius of action, you know, by orders of magnitude, you know, relative to your own physical radius. Uh, and by that, you know, you can, you can sort of form agglomerations of small pebbles that would not gravitationally stick to each other, but move as, as clouds of pebbles, so to speak, and over time sort of uh, co coalesce into, into bigger ensembles and into planetesimals. Uh, 
Uh, and, and that is an effect that actually crosses this, this gap, you know, because um, you know, as an ensemble, then they can you know, get across um, the, the one meter gap that they couldn't do uh, individually. Um, uh, and um, the, the, the effect is that that growth is very rapid. So we can actually go to 10 Earth radii, a planetesimal can go, grow to 10 Earth radii within a thousand years or so. Now that was, that was cool from, from a perspective because um, uh, uh, there, there was an another problem in the, in the uh, accretion theory that was the formation of Jupiter. Apparently Jupiter had to be formed very quickly. Uh, and the, 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 the current theory of the formation of Jupiter is that you have a, uh, an, a terrestrial planet uh, in the gas and it, if it becomes big enough, like 10 Earth radii or so, then the gas collapses on it and forms a Jupiter planet. Uh, and that had to be done before the gas went away and the gas you know, went, uh, went away like 10 million years or so after, um, uh, after the, the formation of the nebula, after CAI. Uh, and you couldn't actually, and we, we've seen this uh, in the previous, according to the weathering model, you cannot form uh, these, these cores so quickly. So therefore, you needed a more effective uh, model in the outer solar system. And the Pebble model just, just came right. Now, um, there, was a, there is still a problem with that, and that has, uh, has recently been solved, uh, been solved um, and uh, you know, some of that is uh, can help to overcome the meter barrier uh, and uh, explain the rapid formation of giant planets by allowing planetismus to rapidly accrete uh, pebbles. This is the 2015 paper. Um, and uh, th there was one problem, if you make it too quickly, you know, you're, you're not forming like four giant planets, you form 20 of them. Uh, and that wouldn't fit. So. Um, uh, in the meantime, they have a bit, little bit of a problem of, of steering this such that um, the accretion of the pebbles is rapid, but not too rapidly. And if it's just right, then you get the right si uh, number of, of, of uh, Jovian plants and that. And there is also a, a most recent um, um, uh, calculation that explains the small size of Mars to that. And this has to do with um, uh, with this the figure here on, on that side, though so there is a, the, 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 the effective radius of a pebble is an exponential function of uh, this parameter here. And this parameter um, you know, has to do with, uh, is the stopping time, um, as that is the, the time that a pebble is uh, a measure of the viscous track on the, on the, on the pebble. Um, uh, in comparison with its encounter time, so the time that uh, it spends in the neighborhood of a passing by um, a planetesimal. Uh, and um, you know, if that becomes big, then of course your, your effective radius becomes small. Uh, and uh, I don't want to go in too much detail, but just to, uh, to, s to say that this is a function of the distance uh, from the central star. So as you go out, from like from the Earth towards Mars, you decrease the effective radius and therefore you're growing a smaller uh, planet. Now there is also a difference between uh, the outer solar system where the, where the velocities of the, uh, of, the, of the planets are smaller than in the inner solar system to which that applies so that you're not you don't have to be concerned about forming 10 Earth mass size uh, planet in the inner solar system. That would only happen in the outer solar system where this range applies. Okay, so if you're interested in the detail, uh, check these, these papers out and uh, they, they will see it. Okay, um, the evolution of a planetesimal then, um, uh, if you're looking at, at one planetesimal itself, uh, uh, can be described by something like that. So you form the planetesimal and then it can have its own life. That's something that we haven't really looked at it so far in this, in this lecture. So it may heat up, it may differentiate and, uh, uh, and, and finally get disrupted. So what we need to introduce uh, in, into our thinking uh, not only look at the formation of bigger ones, but at the evolution of those planetesimals itself. Um, and so you, you go from agglomeration, accretion of dust particles, to compaction, to partial melting, 
made with uh, aluminum 26. I was alluding to that. Latent heat effects and so forth. Convection. Uh, and, and finally, you could destruct it or grow to a planet, uh, if depending on what your, the fate of you as a planetesimal is. You know, some of the planetesimal are still around. is Vesta, Lutetia, Itokawa, this is the Hayabusa uh, 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 asteroid. Uh, we still see them. But here is a, a um, cartoon that uh, Vladimir Neumann, uh, a grad, uh, student of, of mine and Doris Proyas, has uh, 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 come up uh, in a series of papers uh, together with us in recent years. Uh, and um, to illustrate that, you look at this, this thing here. What you plot here is the accretion duration, so the time it takes for your planetesimal to form, uh, versus the onset time relative to time zero, which is the uh, CAI um, uh, time mark. Uh, and um, you know, if you form that uh, planetesimal you know, early, so close to, the, uh, to zero, you know, uh, uh, defined by the CAIs, and you form it slowly, uh, no, uh, fast, <laughs> excuse me, fast, you are in this red regime. And this means that aluminum-26 can heat the planetesimal, you can melt it, you can differentiate it, and you form a miniaturized, plan uh, uh, you know, terrestrial planet through that. You have a regolith on top uh, that may be sintered, you have a partially molten silicate mantle, and you have an iron-iron sulfur core. Now, um, as you start later in the accretion, you're getting into incomplete differentiation, or no di differentiation at all. You know, so if you start late and take a long time to, to form, you're ending with a a planetesimal that is uh, undifferentiated but has you know, some uh, porous regolith on, on top of it. And actually, we find all that in, in, the, in the asteroid belt. There's a whole variety of things in, in the asteroid belt that, um, that you know, is, is matched by, by these uh, scenarios. Um, you can put that in more detail and have the convection and so forth, but in the interest of time, maybe I, um, I uh, skip that. But, but why is that interesting? Now, first of all, to explain the asteroids, the observations in the asteroid belt and the meteorite record. Okay. Uh, then, of course, the question how small uh, a body can actually be differentiated. And that here is, to me, the most important thing. Can you imagine that the terrestrial planets formed from differentiated planetesimals? Okay. Um, because in the old you know, uh, scenarios of formation of a terrestrial planet, you form them from undifferentiated planetesimals, and later you differentiate the, the, the complete planet by forming a core. Now, in the more modern view of it, you form these planets actually from differentiated planetesimals, so they have little cores to begin with. So you are, uh, uh, so the core formation process for a planet can be totally different, you know, whether you start with that or that. And it's important to line out the conditions uh, for, for these. And then another thing is the question of um, how small a planetary body can actually have a self-sustained magnetic field, because there have been reports of findings of magnetized material, you know, meteorites from, uh, from planetesimals. And, uh, uh, it has been proposed that actually a planetesimal could actually support its own magnetic field. And in a scenario like this one here, it can, you know, because it has a hot core, iron core, and it could, you know, have a dynamo in there. Okay, and this is why this is interesting. Now, there is a mission proposal now on its, uh, in, in the consideration uh, for the next discovery, NASA discovery mission is called Psyche. Uh, the PI is uh, Linda Elkins-Tanton. Uh, and it proposes to go to a remnant of a collision with a differentiated planetesimal. So it's an iron asteroid, basically. You know? uh, and it would fly by in about 2020. And this is what people think uh, the crater might look like on it. So it's like a, a melt, an iron melt that is extruded and, and forms you know, this, this, this crater thing here. So it might be very interesting. Uh, before I, I end with... Um, 
uh, with the formation part, let's look a little bit at migration because that is important in the, in the discussion of habitable planetary systems. Though there are basically three, two types of, of migration. And migration means that um, you decelerate a planetesimal and a protoplanet through cavitation interactions with, uh, with um, gravity waves in, in the vicinity of it. So, you know, when a planetesimal moves through the gas, I mean, it can be decelerated by viscous drag. Yes, we've had that already. But it can also clear, you know, a, a surroundings and then move the stuff to the side. And then you have, uh, you know, density waves, you know, in, in, in neighboring you. And any uh, any asymmetry in that can actually cause, you know, the transfer of angular momentum and you can move inward in the type 1 migration uh, or outward in the type 2 migration. So basically it's the interaction of your forming planet, you know, with the rest of it. And that can cause, you know, the inward migration of, uh, of uh, giant planets, but it can also cause an outward migration. But um, what we're seeing today, you know, in these exoplanetary systems uh, with the large number of giant planets that are very close to the stars, you know, is uh, 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 generally explained with type 1 migration having acted, so having brought them close, close to their stars. Um, they, it's, you know, said that they cannot actually have formed there, but, you know, through this migration they've moved inward uh, and uh, uh, and uh, then arrived at their the present location. Uh, and this is an important uh, effect because it has an effect on the habitability. Um, there can also be direct gravitation interaction between planets and, and planetesimals uh, in orbital resonances, and these effects are, you know, basically at the heart of the Nice model, the Grand Tech model, uh, and uh, will now, this we've already seen. We'll look at the Crantac model here. Uh, and uh, well, first of all, can I start this movie? Oh, let's, let's, um, let's explain first that, and then we look at the movie. So um, the Crantac model looks at Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, and uh, it starts out with uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And then it, uh, it has Jupiter move inward uh, and uh, get into this belt of uh, rocky type material uh, and, um, and Saturn moves behind it and catches up to it. And it moves, you know, this, this uh, S-type material, it moves out, okay? Uh, and um, Crantac means a rapid, you know, reversal of the movement. When the two get in resonance, they move outward in uh, together and then scatter the C-type or the, the volatile rich stuff in again, you know, and therefore you form an asteroid belt that has these two components. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, the, uh, the basic story of, of, uh, of the Grand uh, Tag model. And here you see, you know, um, uh, what's happening. So you see Jupiter move in and then Saturn comes in and then they move together, they move out and disperse, you know, this, uh, uh, this material and cause the late heavy bombardment and so forth. And there is a paper by Hansen and others that, um, you know, said that if you have a compressed uh, 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 cloud, so to speak, of, of uh, 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 rocky planetesimals, you can form a small Mars. So the Crantac model also forms you a small Mars. Not only the Pebble model does that, but the Crantac model can do that too. And also it, it causes, I mean, it explains the late heavy bombardment that we'll take a look at later uh, and uh, the formation of the present structure of the asteroid belt. Um, it would also, uh, and this is the astrobiological relevance, it would also stop Jupiter from moving into the habitable zone of our solar system and, and, and having destroyed, you know, what, uh, what uh, you know, is our habitability uh, today. Okay, so the formation part, um, in summary, uh, Laplace, sorry for that, you're in France, oh my god. <laughs> so Laplace is uh, still generally valid. The theory has evolved from a gas discretion model to the modern many particle simulations. 
The Nice model actually is a model of the evolution of the giant plants and dispersal of the Kuiper belt, but there have been variants of that that uh, explain much more. Uh, one of them is the Grand Tack model, the formation of Mars and volatile delivery to the inner solar system and keeping Jupiter you know, out from the inner solar system, I should have added here. Um, and uh, you know, another popular uh, form of it is the pe pebble accretion model that fills the one meter gap by introducing gas pebble interactions. Formation of the giant plants can be explained by that and uh, the smallness of the mass of Mars. Now I think I've reached the... Okay, no, I should, should put, uh, say that too. The, the chronology of it, um, so you form the first parts and then you form Jupiter, you know, within the first few million years. Uh, and before that, the earliest objects, magmatic iron meteorites, the cores of planetary embryos have been formed. Mars also forms pretty early, you know, this is all based on hafnium tungsten and other is isotopic uh, systems. Um, latest time for the completion of Saturn. Uh, Earth forms relatively late uh, and uh, then the latest, uh, you know, relevant to us uh, immediately of immediate relevance is the formation of the moon with the, the moon uh, forming impact. And you see that a lot of this stuff uh, occurs in the first few million years and then it uh, disperses over um, you know, the first 100 million years or so, generally speaking, uh, to form uh, the planetary system as we uh, observe it, um, yeah, at least in its organization uh, today. Uh, and after the moon forming impact, we get then uh, 500 million years later, or a little more than that, we get a, a late um, cataclysm of, of uh, things. This is uh, uh, the late heavy bombardment that may have been caused by Jupiter and Saturn moving outward. Uh, and, uh, but there are also competing models that have many cataclysms or a longer time scale for um, the decrease of, uh, uh, of uh, the uh, formation. Although this is a little bit at variance you know, with this idea that most of the planets formed uh, pretty early on and uh, they wouldn't you know, do that over this extended period of time. Okay. Uh, now, I think it's time for the coffee break, but if you have questions to that. Yeah, okay. No? Okay. <laughs>